We are rocking. Yeah. It is very exciting to be a part of the University of South Florida system. The goal of these videos is to make an emotional connection with the audience. I just find it ironic that in 2016, when we're going to a tobacco-free campus, they want to bring guns to a campus for the first time. Hello, I'm Denise White, and this is University Beat, where we pose the question, what's going on at the University of South Florida? And there's no better place to find that out than from our first guest, the president of University of South Florida System, Dr. Judy Genshaft. And President Genshaft, welcome to University Thank Beat. You. We're so glad Pleasure to have to you here. here. And you know, all three campuses are celebrating, or about to celebrate an anniversary right now. 60 years for Tampa, yes. right? 50 for St. Petersburg, and 40 for Sarasota Manatee. And so from that perspective, how would you assess the overall state of the university system? We are rocking. Yeah. It is very exciting to be a part of the University of South Florida system. We graduate about um, almost 13,000 students every year from the USF system. And um, each of our institutions are serving their own communities as well as serving the whole region. And so um, USF makes a difference. No matter where you've graduated, USF is a part of your university and your economic development in the Tampa Bay region. You know, there's just been so many accomplishments since you've been here the past 16 years. Uh, USF recently was named a top 25 public university for research funding. Uh, there have been other accolades for medicine, engineering, business and overall value. How does that kind of national recognition help the university? It is huge. It's huge because when you're that proficient in writing grants, then other researchers get to know you. They want to work with our researchers and the grant getting is even better. So we bring in about $440 million every year to this Tampa Bay region in outside grants and contracts. Being the top 25 in the country of public universities is awesome. That is impressive. And we're only number two, number two in the state of Florida. The Morsani School of Medicine is going to become part of downtown Tampa. Why is that so important? Well, it's very important. The top uh, medical schools are co-located or very closely located to their major teaching hospital. Only five of the top 100 medical schools are not located next to their teaching hospital. We are one of the five. So for us to go and be next to the major teaching hospital is going to be very, very exciting. We also have teaching sites at other places like the Haley VA, and the Bill Young VA, as well as uh, All Children's Hospital and Shriners, but the major teaching hospital is Tampa General Hospital, so being very close to them mm -hmm. is very exciting, as well as in that building will be the Heart Institute, and that is key also, because this is a research center that will bring new discoveries and best practices for heart issues, and Ca that will cardiovascular move. issues. And that might bring in, probably no doubt, would bring in more funding, and more grants, right? More funding, more grants. It could bring in um, pharmaceutical companies that want to work with uh, in clinical trials um, because you know that heart issues are the number one killer in America. What about on-campus uh, on, and on-campus football stadium? Is that going to happen? Well, everybody is asking me that question. We are going to do a feasibility study, and we'll see what that brings out. What kind of changes do you see in the future, short term and long term? The whole idea of a major university is to get better and better. And in the top 25 of public research universities, now we need to move that up uh, as well. So we're taking 
we're, we're trying to make the environment one that enhances learning. And we have a $135 million project that will be occurring on the Tampa campus that has um, about uh, new residence halls. We'll take down some of our more mature residence halls mm -hmm. that you can't paint anymore right. to make them better. Yes. We'll take some down, we'll add new ones. About 2,000 additional residence halls will be there with shops and um, restaurants, um, a complete recreational center, swimming pool. That will bring a lot more people on the, onto the campus, as well as raising and bringing in more top-level faculty. And top-level faculty bring in students. Students want to come to study with professor this or professor that. Um, so it's, it's raising the bar at all levels. We need to be so connected to uh, the economic development as well as not just providing a workforce, that's certainly part of it, but also working directly with um, uh, industry and bankers and our whole Tampa Bay economy. We do this through USF Sarasota Manatee and USF St. Petersburg, as well as USF Tampa. We want every student to have an internship, whether you're in philosophy, history, accounting, or engineering, nursing, whatever. We want to see every student have an internship. That will bring out some real life experience along with our textbook experience. The other item that I wish will happen, um, every student, whether you're undergrad or grad, will have at least one international experience. As a matter of fact, when students are accepted and they receive at to USF and they receive their uh, portfolio of acceptance, in there is a passport application because we have funds to help people travel internationally. They may even do their internship internationally. Dr. Genshev, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Work has begun on a new research vessel that'll help University of South Florida scientists keep an eye on the Gulf of Mexico. The 78-foot ship will be operated by the Florida Institute of Oceanography. The Institute, which is based at the College of Marine Science at USF St. Petersburg, will use the vessel to study situations like the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill or red tide outbreaks. Institute Director Dr. Bill Hogarth says the new ship will also be used to train the next generation of marine scientists. It's just really the, the one that you can take a lot of students for the day. Uh, it's cheaper. Uh, and we just could do a lot of the training. We want to do the teach classes easier from this vessel. The yet to be named ship will be built by Duckworth Steel Boats in Tarpon Springs. First of all, to keep the jobs and money in the in Florida economy. That's number one, I think. Number two is, you couldn't find a better boat builder. I don't care where you go. You won't find a better boat builder than Duckworth. And it's close to us. We can come up if he has a question, has a problem. It cuts down the cost of a follow-up and making sure that we are involved in the construction. The Institute and its almost 30 members came up with three million dollars to pay for the boat and its equipment and the state matched that money. St. Petersburg is contributing two hundred fifty thousand dollars in funds it received in the BP oil spill settlement. The new ship should be ready to be launched in 12 to 14 months. Concealed weapons on Florida's college campuses carried legally by students, faculty or anyone else licensed to do so. A bill to allow that was approved earlier this year by the Florida House, but was defeated in the state Senate. There is no consensus on the idea in Tallahassee or here at USF, as evidenced by a debate last semester on the Tampa campus. Mark Schreiner reports. Protecting thousands of students, faculty, and staff at the 12 schools in the state university system is a difficult job. Many of the people who work in law enforcement at those schools including the men and women of the University of South Florida Police Departments, believe that difficulty would be compounded by allowing concealed weapons on their campuses. We've had the um, police chiefs 
from around the uh, SUS. They've testified on this matter. The Board of Governors has uh, uh, given an opinion on the matter. And right now, we just really need to wait for this legislation. And we need to see exactly um, what's going to happen. While lawmakers discussed this, the people most directly affected, the students, recently debated the issue as well. Oh, Shana Lopez Rivas, and she was um, a student at FSU, and she was a victim of rape. And she has stated that she resolves to never be a victim again, and she will not be a sitting duck for a rapist or a shooter. About 100 students and faculty braved blustery January evening conditions at the outdoor Marshall Student Center Amphitheater for Debatable. Two students on each side, one group pro-concealed carry, one against, were chosen by USF student government after submitting position papers. It ends up being, you know, an active shooter comes into your classroom and two or three people stand up and you just have to trust that they're not going to accidentally hit you. The students tried to sway the audience not only with facts but emotional arguments as well. I have my girlfriend here today, we have two kids. Which one of you in the audience wants to go to my family and tell them, well, sorry, you know, your son, your boyfriend, whoever, he died today because I didn't allow him to protect himself. I just find it ironic, or more like idiotic, actually, that in 2016, when we're going to a tobacco-free campus, they want to bring guns back on campus, or bring guns on campus for the first time. If I have an option between the two, I say bring back the smokers. They also took up the argument over the safety of gun-free zones. When a person is set to wreak havoc, what they do is they go to a place they're familiar with. They, they don't necessarily think, hey, I'm going to go here because no one has a gun. Because they know they have the advantage anyway, if people have guns or not, because they have the surprise. They have the advantage of the surprise, and that's the biggest advantage. Do you feel safe on the USF campus without concealed carry? Yes, I do, but it's also because I'm a six-foot male at close to 300 pounds, so there's not too many people that feel they're going to go ahead and win over on me. Small female, five foot one, maybe 100 pounds, may not have the same presence of mind. After the debate, students on all sides of the issue weighed in as well. Um, I would never carry a gun on a college campus because, uh, first of all, I am not in favor of guns in general, other than obviously for people who are more than qualified to carry them, such as police officers, military personnel. Um, I think that the statistics are pretty clear. If there are guns, they're more likely to be used. It's pretty obvious. I'm very conflicted on the issue myself because personally I'm kind of against guns, so I kind of wanted to hear a person who had a coherent thought on the other side. But I would definitely take advantage of that bill and I would definitely feel a lot safer on campus knowing that permitted individuals are doing so. The topic is not going away. Concealed carry proponents indicate they'll continue pushing for the legislature to approve the bills. For University Beat, I'm Mark Schreiner. Among the people honored at commencement this spring was USF's first African-American graduate. Dr. Ernest Boger attended on a music scholarship and played with the jazz band. He arrived at the university in 1961, a time when some southern colleges were experiencing racial unrest. But during a visit earlier this year, Boger said the atmosphere at USF was welcoming. Here, in his own words, is what he experienced. There were no overt racially charged situations on campus that I encountered in the four years I was here, and only one or two off campus, only one or two off campuses. So I don't have any dirt. Um, and uh, there was a certain amount of tension uh, because this was a time when uh, a lot of uh, uh, things were happening in Alabama and Mississippi and South Carolina and like that. And people were, were, were continuing to look at a USF to see, well, what's going to happen when that first person goes? What's going to happen the next year, maybe 10? What's going to happen the next year and a few more? And nothing of consequence, nothing at all happened here. Uh, I was visited by the FBI who asked me some questions about uh, uh, my involvement and so on and so forth. I, I'm sure I was personally watched very carefully uh, by the federal government at that time. I could talk a, a bit about um, some of the situations that were uh, products of the time, uh, such as traveling with the uh, uh, university concert band ensemble and not being able to stay in hotels and having to stay uh, in private uh, black family accommodations. There's some things like that. There were the vestiges of segregation, but um, 
again, these were some of the uh, realities of, of the time and did not uh, tarnish my uh, experience here. Ten years ago, another USF student wanted to celebrate the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, but in a way that incorporated Dr. King's legacy of service. That student was named Maxon Victor, and his idea became the tradition known as the Stampede of Service, a day of volunteering. This year, about 2,000 students, administrators, faculty, and staff turned out. They worked with dozens of organizations throughout the Bay Area on a variety of projects. Everything from cleanup, repair, taking donations, and helping to cook meals. Stampede of Service is hosted by USF Center for Leadership and Civic Engagement. From a peek at the past to a look to the future, this fall, USF Sarasota Manatee will begin enrolling students in its new STEM college. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. The change will result in more classes aimed at meeting the technology demands of the workforce. The new College of Science and Mathematics has been more than a year in the planning. So a student who joins us will, ha will have the benefit of the small student to faculty ratio that we have of 13 to 1. They, the student would work alongside world-class professors and world-class researchers, for example, in our biology program at the Moat Marine Laboratories. This is all done in an environment that many times people describe as being a private school education at a public school price. Eventually, the Sarasota campus is scheduled for new buildings and dormitories, more undergraduate research, and new partnerships with local businesses. Also in place is a program that allows students to earn credits on six different area campuses and count them towards a single degree. We've, we've looked at some opportunities that we might make available for students to take courses at each other's institutions if there are particular things that one of us offers that the other doesn't. The Chancellor says the campus has an ambitious five-year transformation plan and that it's on track to meet its goals. Dance is something we usually associate with entertainment. We watch dancers, we might even dance ourselves, especially if we think no one is watching. But dance as an agent of social change, as a way of possibly saving lives, well, that's what members of the USF School of Dance are trying to do. Hedel Gandhi has their story. Victims of human trafficking live in the shadows. They get tighter, get tighter, get tighter, and smothering, smothering, smothering. Good, good, good. And Madison kind of These dance moves point. painting a vivid picture of the reality they face every day. What we're trying to portray is the scenario of what's called a Romeo pimp. Someone who specifically sets out to have their victims fall in love with them, that they'll do anything. And Antonio, what I'm really looking for right now is uh, this controlling kind of movement. USF assistant professor Andrew Carroll choreographs these dance videos to promote social change. Um, exactly, it keep taking, keep taking. The feeling of being trapped and struggling and bound to this, even though you know something is wrong, and it, she's bound to you no matter what she does. Capturing that struggle means studying human trafficking closely so that Carol and his dancers can properly portray both the victim and the pimp. He could be in your very backyard, in your neighborhood, in your, in your own local schools. Uh, this idea of a man that will uh, force a girl almost to fall in love with him and then use her and make her feel like she's the one doing all of the wrong. Madison McGrew, the senior who plays the victim, says this project and opened so her eyes. Why does this cause exist? Why do people find it in their hearts to do bad? What can I do to bring more good? Am I partaking in the bad by not being a voice? These videos help create that voice. It began with this anti-bullying campaign. You could see them sitting at a computer and reaching back because they were being cyberbullied or receiving messages that were startling. Um, and then I would crossfade it to that dancer actually on stage, kind of in movement, what that might feel like. The goal of these videos, to make an emotional connection with the audience, not just those sitting here in the theater, but people throughout the nation 
and across the globe. Because there's no actual language, people in Finland were using it just as much as people in Australia, in Germany, in America, and I thought, wow, this is a great medium. A video so powerful, it was adopted by the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control as part of their anti-bullying campaigns. Carol said it had an impact on both victims and bullies. He said, if I had seen your video in school, I would have stopped bullying. And I thought, okay, you know, this video can work. And if it can just stop one person, then we've done good. That inspired Carol to create other projects like this date rape awareness video and this one about suicide prevention. All share one common lesson. If you see it happening, help. Talk to somebody, stand up for them, stand up for what's right, which became a slogan for the uh, title of the video. Videos that speak volumes without ever saying a word. For University Beat, I'm Hedel Gandhi. This past spring, University Beat told you about Bob Seymour, the longtime host of All Night Jazz on WUSF-FM. Bob was retiring after more than three decades at the station. We wanted to know what brought Bob to WUSF, why he stayed, and why jazz. With jazz through the night, every night we'll have NPR news updates every hour. I'm Bob Seymour. <laughs> Growing up in the 50s, early 60s, I was one of those kids with uh, my transistor radio always to my ear or up late at night, logging all the stations I could get to the degree that I heard jazz coming from radio from Chicago. It always spoke to me. I wanted, it, I was the kind of kid who read the fine print on the back of an album and uh, pursued my interest, followed my heart, and uh, the music, the in the nowness, the spontaneity of it, and the from the heartness of jazz really just always uh, made me want to hear more. This is Jaco Pastorius, Three Views of a Secret on All Night Jazz. It's not in the mainstream of American culture in a way, but there's so much great music, of course, in the history of jazz. And great music being made right now. Once it's uh, in your system, uh, it is something that you want to know more and more about. I began doing radio after college, moved to uh, Florida, but after a couple of stations in the Bay Area and Sarasota, a job came open, a friend told me about it, uh, at WUSF, jazz slash news slash production. And at that point I was working at an all news station, had a strong interest in a lot of music, but especially jazz, and it just seemed uh, tailor-made. I got real lucky. I never imagined uh, 35 years in one place, and uh, 35 years, of course, in a job in radio is uh, a pretty strange thing. But I, again, I've uh, been very lucky, and uh, it is really, it's a little hard to believe. It's uh, really flown by. I've stayed at WUSF because fits the bill in so many ways. I can be involved with music that I really love. The weather's good, the arts community is vibrant, and it's been a terrific place to be for what's turned into 35 years. The listeners are the vital link in the chain, and I've made lifelong friendships with uh, people who listen to the station. It's always a, a real kick to meet someone who know that you've made a difference in their lives. And the artists and the people in the music world who uh, you really have a closer relationship with the listener than you do sometimes with those you work with because you tend to work individually doing a radio program, uh, especially at night. I uh, don't even think of it as a, a mass medium. I'm always talking to one single person, not a particular person, but always addressing the individual listener. It's nice when somebody uh, uh, lets you know that they're listening and they're sharing that moment with you. But to me, that's always been important, is just the radio as a medium that uh, you're addressing that one person. This is All Night Jazz on WUSF 89.7. More coming up, NPR News is next. It's been a great ride. I want to say thanks. If there's a story about the University of South Florida you'd like to see us cover, let us know. 
Our email address is ubeat at wusf.org. Our website is universitybeattv.org. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching University Beat TV. Thank you for joining us on University Beat. I'm Denise White.